Elon, sir, look, we can watch the video of the Falcon 9 landing. Oh, yes, the, the, the reusable rocket booster, of course, but th this video is very pixelated. It looks awful. It's just terrible. Well, yeah, I know. It's on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean. The internet's not very good out there. Ah, uh, yes, uh, we gotta get on that. We'll make our own internet. Our own internet? No, sir, we would have to send up thousands of satellites in order to maintain an orbit that was low enough so that the signal could be strong. That would take so much time and money. Yes, uh, yes it would, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to get 350 megabits download in the ocean. We can charge people for it who are on boats and stuff because satellites are everywhere. They cover the whole planet. Yeah, I, I, I guess we could do that. That would take a lot of time and energy and stuff, but will absolutely be worth it. In fact, there's people on, on land, right? There's people everywhere. Yeah, that's, that, that's typically where people live, I think. We should just sell the internet to people on land. They'll pay for it. In fact, that'll cover the rocket launch costs in the long term. All right, I, I guess that works. You know, maybe the Wi-Fi is just not very good here, though. That might be the reason the, the landing looks so pixelated. We're gonna need a lot more people in order to make all this happen. We need to put people on Mars. I need to have some more shoes. <sighs> okay, I'm pretty sure that was just Twitter compression, but oh well. <laughs> Let's begin. So while I'm not on Starlink anymore, I still love covering all of the changes and upgrades they make to the internet service because SpaceX is awesome and this showcases how game-changing Starlink is as a global internet provider because they've essentially launched a brand new tier and if you thought Starlink Premium was bad, you know, the business grade internet that costs $2,500 up front and then $500 a month, well, just wait, Starlink Maritime is even worse. This comes with a $10,000 upfront price requirement and and then, to maintain service, it's $5,000 a month. Now, when you first hear that, you're like, uh, you could buy a lot of houses for less than that kind of money. That's much, much lower than a lot of people's mortgage payments, but why is this so dang expensive? Who the heck is gonna sign up for this? Well, if you look into how much maritime internet actually costs, this is honestly really, really competitive, considering Starlink is saying to expect up to 350 megabits download with Starlink Maritime, and they have a map on the website showcasing that right now it's mostly active along the coasts but especially around the Mediterranean Sea it has a lot of coverage but they expect that coverage to expand in the fourth quarter of this year and then expand even further to the more southern parts of our hemisphere in the first quarter of next year so if you actually start looking at VSAT internet pricing for boats in the middle of the ocean it is honestly quite astounding how bad it is like this is what all cruise ships rely on all of the Navy boats out there aircraft carriers and battleships and also just fishing boats and shipping boats. All of these guys love to stay connected. You know, sometimes you have a few dozen crew members. Other times you could have hundreds of tourists on these ships. And of course they want FaceTime. They want to watch YouTube. There's a lot of data demands, even out at sea. And all of these VSAT prices involve you getting usually somewhere between two megabits per second, sometimes eight. And if you're lucky, you can get somewhere around maybe 20 megabits per second. And all of those god awful speeds are cost these boat companies tens of thousands of dollars a year. They're paying well over $5,000 a month for the fastest internet package, which honestly is not very fast at all. So what Starlink Maritime basically highlights is how bad the pricing structure is for boats already, but that's because it's very hard to get reliable satellite internet out at sea because not only do you have to try to pinpoint your dish right at a satellite because most satellite internet is geosynced with the Earth's rotation, so you have to have fancy equipment to track that satellite, but also the boat is always moving, you know? You're gonna have waves and you're gonna have seas that can get rough during certain parts of the year, and that makes the internet perform even worse, and that's why all of this maritime internet is costing everybody a fortune. So Starlink is actually undercutting their competitors and offering speed that is like over 10 times faster than what people were getting before. So while to people like you and me, this sounds ridiculous and like who the heck would pay for it, it actually makes a crap ton of sense for everybody who who's paying for internet on boats right now. So absolutely expect this to start to become the norm moving forward for all cruise ships. And I'm sure the military and navies of many countries are gonna wanna sign up for this because there's basically no better alternative. Starlink is using thousands of low earth orbit satellites that can deliver on a frequency that allows for that higher bandwidth. And it doesn't require as fancy equipment because the satellites are not geosynced. But a lot of people were just wondering, well, aren't they still price gouging though? Because isn't this the same equipment 
equipment as the Starlink for RVs package and that kind of thing? Well, not exactly. There's a bit more to it than that, and Elon detailed on Twitter that for Starlink Maritime, you actually get two Starlink terminals, and these are the high-powered ones. So the same terminals that you would get if you bought Starlink Business, so this one's a bit bigger. It has a wider array to choose from, which means maintaining signal at sea should be easier because you'll have two dishes that will orient themselves best they can, and they're a wider phased array than what you would get with Starlink for RVs. But also an important point to bring up is that a lot of Starlink users right now, both residential and for RVs, are using ground stations that are nearby. So when you send a signal, it goes up to the satellite and then back down to your nearest possible ground station, and then that connects you to the server you're trying to reach. You don't really have that luxury at sea because there's no ground stations out there. So that means if you're trying to, you know, play a video game or download content at 300 megabits per second and you're way out in the middle of the Pacific or the Atlantic, you are actually going to be consuming a lot more bandwidth because now they're going to have to divert you to another satellite. And right now with the version 1 and 1.5 Starlink satellites that SpaceX has been sending up, a lot of them don't have the capability to do that at all. Or if they do, it's at very limited capacity. So that means you're a heavier bottleneck on the overall Starlink network. So they price it accordingly because they don't want a ton of people signing up all at once. And if they made the pricing really, really low, then everybody who has a canoe basically out at sea would be able to tap into this internet and consume a lot more bandwidth on the overall network. So you want to price things accordingly to your competition. And of course, Starlink is in a big rush to become as profitable as possible as soon as they can, because that was the whole purpose of the program for SpaceX at the beginning was to provide a service that people love and enjoy while at the same time making that a profitable income stream so that they can pay to put people eventually on Mars and fund the Starship program, which in case you haven't kept up with the Starship updates, feel free to check out NASA Spaceflight. Our good friend Nick from the Talos of Tech podcast has been working really, really hard documenting all the progress going on at Starbase, but all of this rocket development takes a lot of money, so that was the goal from the beginning was to get Starlink profitable, and I honestly think this makes a ton of sense for them to prioritize the higher paying customers first, kind of like how Tesla started with the Roadster and then worked their way down. Starlink isn't really doing that. They kind of started with residential and then moved into RV and now they're moving into maritime, but maybe the service just wasn't possible to work at sea before and now it is. But it makes a lot of sense to look at how much you're paying for satellite internet at sea, which most people were getting god awful speeds and they were paying over $6,000 a month for those speeds. And now they have an option for a cheaper provider that can increase speeds by over 10x. So that's just going to make a whole lot of sense for most boats out there. And there's a lot of big ones that are going to take advantage of those speeds and they will pay whatever they need to to get it. So that means high margin, high income revenue for Starlink, which gets us closer to putting people on the moon and Mars. And it means better internet for people out in the middle of the ocean. So I consider that a great thing. And it's very logical, despite the fact that it's not really intended for us and it doesn't really make much sense for consumers. But the only reason those prices are so shocking is because we're not used to there being one internet service provider that, you know, gives people in the middle of Nebraska fast internet and also lets you, hey, you can attach this to your RV and have internet on the go. Also be the same company that's like, by the way, yeah, here's our $5,000 a month package for people at sea. But that's why I think Starlink is so influential and has a very high risk of becoming a monopoly and maybe needing to be broken up in the future because no other company can compete with these speeds. No other company can get satellites into orbit as quickly as SpaceX does or or as affordably as SpaceX does because they've developed these reusable rocket boosters and no other company has come close to even attempting a reusable rocket booster. And yet SpaceX has turned it into this regular thing. It happens all the time. So they've drastically lowered the cost of bringing payloads to orbit. And that means that they're basically going to have a permanent advantage on satellite internet from here on out. In fact, once Starship is online and operational, they're going to be deploying next generation satellites that will have laser sat communications between each other that should drastically lower the ping for Starlink users and increase the uptime, increase the download and upload. Once most of the Constellation is using these version 2 satellites that need Starship to launch, that's when you should start to expect gigabit internet from Starlink, which I think could honestly start to compete with land-based internet and even 5G in a lot of places. So the fact that they can have an addressable market as wide as the entire planet, I think it gives them a severe advantage over every other internet provider, which is usually pretty region based. So congratulations to people paying big bucks for maritime internet. You now have a much faster alternative and hopefully Starlink can become profitable as soon as possible. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you all in the next one.